Dave's back from Ireland, and plenty has happened in the last two weeks, so this is what we like to call a catch-up episode. Yeah, today we're going to have an extended chat about all the things that have caught our eye in the last couple of weeks. What has caught your eye recently? Have we missed anything? Let us know via our social media pages at Space and Things Podcast on Instagram, threads and facebook or via the contact form on our website and please consider joining us over at patreon.com forward slash space and things but right now enjoy episode 161 of the space and things podcast you're listening to the space and things podcast with emily carney and dave giles I'm Emily Carney. And I'm Dave Giles, and welcome to episode 161 of the Space and Things podcast. A very special episode, so much so that we have Bandit with us today. I believe yes. uh, <laughs> if you hear any me- meowing in the background, <laughs> it may be because uh, <laughs> Bandit is with us for the recording, which is always fun. He is here right now. So, what's up? He's, yeah, I tried putting him in the other room but that didn't work so <laughs> hi buddy how you doing emily i'm doing great how are you doing i know you went to ireland recently yeah i went to the west coast of ireland for my friend's wedding it's a beautiful place lots of old buildings where the roof has fallen down oh wow if only they had roofers in ireland that were available and people could afford to pay them about 100 years ago there could be some really awesome buildings but it's still pretty cool to see all the ruins and stuff but uh yeah the, the, i think the potato famine and the goddamn english uh really did a number on them um back in the day so uh yeah but it's still a beautiful beautiful country and beautiful people and wonderful food so i had a great time and west coast what was nice about it was the beautiful dark skies oh wow not every night was clear uh because they like clouds in ireland as well but when it was it was absolutely stunning so many stars in the sky um which is always fun just sitting there and looking up and seeing so many stars i took a photo with my phone um and did the old 10 second aperture whatever it is open the lens for 10 seconds yeah. thing. I've never seen anything like it. I can't believe I took it. It was like, no, this this can't be right. <laughs> like, that can't be what I just took, but it was. It was a beautiful photo. I, I've seen it and it was really awesome. So next month, I'm not going to Ireland, but I'm going to Canada in October. Oh, for the dark sky. I was talking about this with Lucy because we, it remind, we haven't seen all that dark sky. I was like, I think there's a dark sky festival in Jasper in Alberta, right? Yeah, it's in Jasper, God, I, I don't know anything about Canada. I'm embarrassed to admit I'm from Florida. I know very little about geography. Um, it's on the other side of uh, other side of us. Uh, it's on the West Coast. But uh, I'm going to be at the Jasper Dark Sky Festival speaking next month. I'm really excited about seeing the skies because in Florida, where I'm at especially, there's so much light pollution. We don't really get a good view of the cosmos, really. I mean, we see a few things, but... Uh, I'm really excited about it. I, I can't wait because I've I probably am going to see things that I haven't seen before. Absolutely. What is the darkest sky you think you've seen? You must have seen some in your time. Is, is there one that really stands out? Probably in the middle of the ocean. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. I, I I'm guessing. God, where was I? I don't even know where I was. Like I was probably in the mid middle of the Mediterranean or something like that. Uh, all I know is it was hot. <laughs> I remember going to I think it was Vultures Row. Where it was like a little place where you could watch planes, you know, take off and, and land and stuff like that. And it was at night. And I went out there and I just looked up and I was like, oh my gosh, this is crazy. Like, I'd never seen so many stars in my life. Remember the first time looking up and seeing a, a satellite go across the sky? Obviously, it's fairly common now, but... But when, when there weren't that many up there and, and they were harder to see, I was in the... I was lucky enough to go to the Rockies in Canada in August 1997 and we camped out overnight one night it was supposed to be in teepees but it was warm enough to be outside uh and and we were just looking up and never seen so many stars and it stays with you doesn't it when you see see it like that oh yeah it's something you don't really you don't really forget yeah like seeing your first spacecraft or something like that it's like you don't really forget that experience it was really cool absolutely 
Right. Let's crack on with what's been catching our eye. I think what we should do is just do one at a time until we've run out. Yeah. There's so much to, to be talking about. So uh, you start. Uh, obviously, Osiris Rex, the uh, sample return capsule, returned to Earth uh, mm-hmm. safely, as far as I know, on Sunday, uh, September 24th. I was watching it when it was happening, and it was really cool. It came down over the Utah desert, uh, the, pretty much as predicted. I, I'm not sure if NASA's even released any of this yet. I'm not aware of any uh, deviations from the actual sample return plan. Uh, it did appear to come back three minutes early, uh, which I thought was kind of interesting. But uh, <laughs> yeah, it came back uh, under, I didn't see the drogue shoots. They may have deployed, but I didn't see them. But that could just be owing to the the footage on the TV because it, it's not a very, the, the sample return capsule, it wasn't very big. So I could have just missed it. But uh, I did see the main chute come down and, and it looked undamaged. And now the uh, sample return capsule has been taken to Houston where it's going to be analyzed. I saw a picture. I'm, I'm not sure if I was supposed to see it, but uh, I saw a picture uh, of them. Uh, I guess it was yesterday. The, the sample itself was being returned to Houston on Instagram. And there was kind of a big kerfuffle at, at Johnson Space Center. You know, a lot of people there. So that's really cool. I, I think a lot of people are, are mistaken that it, it, they think it's the first ever sample return mission. It's not. It's I believe it's the United States' first sample return mission. And then funnily enough, the Science Museum in London has just put on display the tiniest speck from that uh, Jap- Japanese sample return. They've just uh, f- managed to get hold of a piece. I was there last week for the Apollo Remasters event. Uh, that was that was going on with Andy Saunders, and I, they said, "Oh, we've just got this new uh, Hayabusa two sample, which was the the Japanese mission that, that happened not that long ago. wasn't wasn't that long ago, but they've got a tiny, and <laughs> the display is really funny because it it almost shouldn't be there because you can hardly see anything, and they've kind of got a diagram of what you're looking at, and it's basically a speck of dust, but it's still cool yeah, that those bit samples of dust, are already yeah. already getting out to to people." So we can see, oh, hey, that's come from an asteroid. That's pretty cool. And it hasn't come through our atmosphere in a fiery ball, but has come through in a controlled container, um, which yeah. was also a fiery ball. But anyway, that's another, another thing. I love the image uh, images from this sample return mission. I didn't get to watch it uh, myself, but the images of seeing someone walk up to the little capsule, uh, the woman walking up and, and checking it. <laughs> I just thought that was wonderful. But yeah, but the, I believe the samples are now in Houston, as you said, and it'll be interesting to see see what happens here. Also, I, f- I feel like for us, it's kind of, on Space and Things, it's kind of a full circle moment because yeah. we did the show, that I think we did the show the day they got the sample uh, in 2020. And I remember, you know, how excited we were. And, and the footage from that is still freaking amazing. I mean, the idea that a spacecraft can go up to a an asteroid and just uh, boop it boop its nose that's what i call it when i when i boop bandit here bandit's nose the idea that a spacecraft can do that and collect some of it and bring it back to earth and now it's going on now it's been renamed it's um osiris apex and it's going to go visit uh the asteroid i believe it's an asteroid apophis it's going to do another mission i mean to me that's like I don't want to feel conspiracy idiots, but that it's almost unreal sounding. I mean, it really yeah. is because that that's something that you're like, is that they could do that nowadays? Like that, that's crazy. It, and it does sound like science fiction, but it is in fact stuff we're actually doing nowadays, which to me is crazy. And I remember when it launched too, uh, years back. I don't know where it is now. I had the t-shirt from the launch. Huh. I actually have the shirt from the launch. I don't know where it is now. It's a. It, it was a nice. Do you have your shirts? categorized because i'm i know you have thousands of shirts so <laughs> it, is it a, like a library is there a cue card somewhere where you can find out what drawer everything is in or, or are you not that organized with your shirt you know i'm not that organized you should be. Um, i i need to be i need to go through all of them i have probably hundreds of shirts literally i think i have a i have a t-shirt for every occasion if i'm grumpy <laughs> and i don't want to be somewhere i have a shirt for it that basically says how i feel about it i'm serious like i'm not even joking i'm like i have a a, a pretty i have t-shirts for everything and i probably should not admit this well, on this podcast that's funny because i remember being a kid in florida and 
there are some great t-shirt shops in Florida. Yes. Where you literally, you're right, you have a slogan for everything on any t-shirt. And I, I can only recall seeing t-shirt shops like that in Florida. I'm sure they exist elsewhere, but it's a real vivid memory yeah. of going through those t-shirt shops and being very impressed. Yeah, and if I if we don't have it, I could I could make it yeah, probably. Absolutely, like, yeah. That's sad. Like my brain will probably make it or find it or something like that. <laughs> but um I think I had an Osiris Rex shirt from the launch though. I I don't know if I still have it. For all I know it may have gotten destroyed by Bandit or something like that. <laughs> I have no idea, but I I know I I used to have one at least. And I remember when it was launched. I think it was launched in 2016 at I want to say near the in the in the autumn, like in fall. It's really cool. I I can't believe it's happened. You know, and now it's going to do another mission, yeah. which to me just shows you how NASA is smart with budgeting. They're like, oh, we're gonna get our money out of this thing and send it another place too, and have it explore this. I think that's really cool. Absolutely. Also, I, over here, I was very impressed with how much coverage it got. The sample return got. There was lots of coverage. BBC had it as a main story on their website. Oh, wow. Uh, which, which is pretty cool. Uh, I got a message from my friend who's never listened to our podcast before and said, hey, I just listened to your podcast because I wanted to find out more about the asteroid. And obviously we did an uh, episode last week about what happened. And that because the coverage it, it received, he thought, oh, Dave must have done something about this. And he, he looked up our podcast. And uh, so, Lewis, I doubt you're listening this week, but hello, Lewis. But that goes to show that these stories can connect with people, make people want to know more. And then learn more about what is going on in the world of space flight and get them to us, which is obviously the main thing, right? Absolutely. <laughs> I don't know if you've seen this, Emily, but there's been a, a, a guy in the, in the news a lot over the last couple of weeks in space news. He's, been, he's come up twice. Uh, you may have heard of him. His name is Thomas Hanks. Yeah, I've heard of I think his name's <laughs> familiar. He's been on a couple shows, TV shows, I think. Yeah, a couple, couple of movies, I think. His wife is amazing. She's a great actress, man. I think that you may know her, know yeah. him more because his wife is an amazing actress and singer, Rita Wilson. Incredible. So may, maybe people might be more familiar with her work. He was on this show back in the day called Booze and Buddies. It was really funny. Yeah. <laughs> I remember him. Yeah. Yeah. Well, he's been in the news because he said that uh, he would like to go to space. Shock horror. Um, it's no surprise that, that Tom Hanks is a big space geek. Uh, I heard once that he can actually name every single space shuttle crew. Oh, wow. See, I can't even do that. I don't know if that's true. I can't do that. I can do everything pre-shuttle mission, but then I, I get bogged down with the shuttle because there's just so many people and so many missions. Anyway, he has said that uh, he would happily be the toilet cleaner for the opportunity to go to space. His exact quote was, I would be the guy that cleans up, make jokes, tells stories, and keeps everybody entertained. Now... A bit of a nothing story, that. But what is cool is that there is a new immersive experience which is running in London from December 6th to April 21st called The Moonwalkers, A Journey with Tom Hanks. Wow. And this is going to use the images from uh, Apollo Remastered and the the team that put the uh, Saturn V on the Washington Monument for the 50th anniversary of, of Apollo 11. And they're running an immersive experience with Tom Hanks narrating you round uh, these images of people on the moon. And it's, uh, apparently the Artemis II crew have been interviewed wow. for it as well. So there's going to be some looking forward with that as well. So, uh, yeah, get, if tickets are on sale, the links will be in the show notes, obviously. And if anyone wants to go uh, who's in London, please let me know because I'll probably happily go lots of times to this because it'd be nice to have something in London. I'm not in, Lo in London anymore, but I'll travel in. So if you're traveling into London over in that window, it's a big old time, December 6th to April 21st. Let's go and see this together. I think it's something we should expect experience together i need to save up my pennies and just come over and see it seeing sort of the preview website for it i was like this looks freaking amazing like it really looks yeah. spectacular and both of us we haven't we didn't experience you know apollo as it was happening you know which which frankly sucks i'll just be honest we didn't we didn't experience as it was happening you know so and and i want to say there's been some awesome movies and books about Apollo that have brought us closer, you know, like Apollo Remastered, great example. The Apollo 11 movie also, it was fantastic, but still, you know, we didn't quite get to see it as it was happening, you know, and that would have been cool, but I think this is another thing, just like the book and the 
you know, the movie brings us a little bit closer to what actually happened back then, which is which is really cool. Absolutely. Well, it's always good to have Tom Hanks in the news as well. Yeah, that that guy is going to be a big success. I mean, his his, his <laughs> uh, acting his acting career. I I've heard good things about it. He's going to be big. Someone to watch for the Somebody future. Somebody to that's watch. For sure. Yeah, Tom Hanks is someone to watch. Exactly. He's a yeah, up and, a rising star up, on IMDb. <laughs> up, coming star. Yeah. Yeah, you got you guys may have not heard of him, but if you haven't, you've heard of him. We're we're breaking the news about him. So yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Let's look him up. Look him Definitely up. look up his greatest hits. Anyway. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> he's he's amazing. So another story that is kind of, pardon the pun, under the radar, but that caught my eye this week. And this is from space.com. There's a spacecraft out there that was launched a few years ago that freaking flew. Please excuse the mild expletive, but this is amazing. It freaking flew through a major coronal mass ejection. Oh, yeah. And didn't die. Yeah. The Parker Solar Probe, according to Space.com, drifted through a CME, that's the, the acronym for it, unscathed on September 5th. First of all, I think it's incredible that the spacecraft actually survived it. And they also found that the CME, uh, this is directly quoted from the story, these aren't my words, blew dust away along an approximately 6 million mile long, which is 9.7 million kilometers, a uh, path from the sun. Guillermo uh, Stenborg, an astrophysicist at uh, John Hopkins uh, University APL and uh, the lead author of the, the paper that discussed CMEs in um, 20, I think it was in 2003, compared it to a sort of a vacuum cleaner. I'm not a solar physicist expert, a solar physicist, so I am probably making no sense here, uh, but just like a freshly vacuumed room, the gap in interplanetary dust quickly filled in with yet more interplanetary dust. There's basically a, a theory that CMEs uh, clean up dust, and the, the Parker Solar Probe is basically out there trying to prove this this theory, that these are things that uh, happen when you uh, have a coronal mass ejection. I know these things can affect Earth, like I said, I'm not a solar physicist. I, I'm speaking from <laughs> I'm speaking from my behind here because I don't know a lot about this <laughs> subject. I'm not an expert in that field. Uh, if anybody is, uh, Ed Gibson, if you're out there, feel free to step in uh, and take over <laughs> for me. But uh, I do know that CMEs can have an effect on Earth as well. They uh, can disrupt electricity basically on Earth or disrupt the electric field, like the magnetic field on Earth, basically. Which causes a uh, aurora, and it also causes uh, can cause issues with like communication and stuff like that. Uh, to me, the takeaway I got from this story that blew my mind was, oh my god, a spacecraft basically flew through part of the sun and survived. <laughs> I'm like, what? Like it was another thing for me, like Osiris Rex. Like, what a time we live in nowadays. Because I mean, you you just wouldn't have heard about this, you know, twenty, thirty something, you know, years ago. Nowadays. Wow, we have spacecraft that have the capability to do such things. That was something that really caught my eye this week. And like I said, I'm not an expert on the field of uh, solar physics, but it's something, it's a subject that really interests me because I've always been interested how the sun affects Earth, you know, because obviously we orbit the sun. There's a book out there. Everybody should check it out. I read it a few months ago. Uh, my boss actually recommended it to me, and I loved it. It's called The Sun Kings. That's the name of the book. It's by Stuart Clark. And it's basically about um, an event in the 1800s called the Carrington Event when a large, basically a huge solar flare caused a solar storm. And I mean, this was like the worst solar storm ever. Like telegraph booths exploded. It knocked out communications at the time. It was just doing crazy stuff. Yeah. Nowadays, if something like that happened, given that we have digital communications, we have the internet, we have astronauts up in space, this is a horrible what if, the consequences would likely be a lot worse of something like that happening. But it's a fascinating read. And if you have any interest in this kind of field, I highly recommend reading it. But 
like I said, I am not the expert on this, but I just thought it was amazing to read about that. Yeah, it's a fascinating story. And this this uh, this new paper that's been published is, is definitely worth a read as well. Check it out. I'll, again, link will be in the show notes. So um, on a slightly more negative note, uh, we in, in the last two weeks, as far as I'm aware, there have been two launch failures. I don't know if you saw these, Emily. Yes, I did. Rocket Lab uh, had... Uh, a failure of one of their launches of their Electron rocket. It was their ninth launch attempt of the year, and this one didn't reach orbit. At the time I uh, of me doing this research, they've not announced exactly went wrong. There's some speculation. It's to do with the second stage. Okay. It either failed to ignite or uh, something something went wrong, but it just it didn't keep going. Yeah. So, unfortunately, that meant the payload didn't make it to orbit, which is obviously not good. And yeah. a Chinese startup called Galactic Energy had their first failure of their Ceres-1 vehicle, which has previously flown nine times without a failure. So, yeah, a couple of uh, reminders that space is hard. Yeah. Obviously, a shame about those payloads not making it into orbit. Yeah, it, but we, we hope Rocket Lab and, and this Chinese company, we hope they have success again because... Like yeah, you yeah. said, space is hard. I, I think we're reminded of that anytime something like this happens. If it were easy, everybody would be doing it. Um, you know, and uh, it doesn't really speak to the employees or the people who work at these places because I'm sure no, extremely bright people are there. It's just space is not a forgiving environment. Yeah, our thoughts are with them. Oh, absolutely. I know these rockets aren't the Saturn V, so this is a little bit of a poor comparison. However, I read somewhere, or it was in one of the documentaries on movies, that there are, what, three million parts of the Saturn V rocket. And if 99.99% of those parts work, that means 300 parts didn't work. Which is quite scary, really, when you think about it. It's when you've got people sitting on top of that much rocket fuel but fortunately these rockets didn't have people on board so um although the payloads have been lost and that's obviously never good uh the companies should be able to fight another day hopefully and 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 show us what they they're capable of and what they can learn from these but it's we shouldn't expect these things to be perfect every time because to get a hundred percent of all these complex parts working correctly every time is damn hard. We have to be prepared for this to not work sometimes. Yeah, absolutely. And I think it was John Young who said, you know, if you're sitting on, and I'm probably really misquoting this, but he said something to the effect of, you know, if you're sitting on top of thousands of pounds of, you know, liquid hydrogen and oxygen and you're not scared, you're not aware of the problem. Yeah, absolutely. If it was yeah. easy, everybody would be able to do it. Houston, this is space and things base here. It's time. To crack on. This is kind of a neat thing. I, I just read this, and this is another story that I got from uh, space.com. NASA is asking for space tug ideas to deorbit the uh, International Space Station when the program is scheduled to conclude in 2030. The story is that NASA is asking, and this is from space.com US industry, for proposals to create a space tug for removing the International Space Station from orbit in the early 2030s. These proposals are due on November 17th, and more details about the requirements are available on a U.S. government website. We will have these links in our show notes. If if you're a contractor who has an interest in uh, suggesting something, uh, be our guest. Number one, this story kind of brought to my attention that the ISS is going to end in less than 10 years. That's not a very long time. And um, it also brought to mind, you know, how are they going to deorbit the ISS? Because it's enormous. It's bigger than Skylab. You know, it's been built in... Um, Skylab, of course, was a, not a modular space station. It was one piece. It still remains, I think, the largest... I want to say Skylab still is the largest thing that's been deorbited. And the ISS is much bigger because it was built in a bunch of pieces. Yeah. I'm just wondering how, you know, that's going to be done. Are they going to break it apart, break all the different modules apart, and just deorbit them separately? I don't even know if that's possible. That's the thing. Like, I'm just speculating here. So I'm really interested to see how this story sort of unfolds. I've read about space tugs before, but 
they were actually um, early 70s ideas. I know ESA had an idea for a space tug for the space shuttle back in like the early 1970s. And then that was turned into like Space Lab, basically. And now a lot of Space Lab heritage is in Columbus, which is on is a, which is the European module on the ISS. So I know a little itty bitty bit about space tugs just from reading about that kind of stuff. This obviously would be a, a U.S. effort to do such a thing, but I'm really interested to see what ideas they're, they're going to come up with because this is something I think about. Like, how are they going to deorbit the ISS into, like, the Pacific or something like that? Like, can you imagine just chilling in a boat somewhere and all of a sudden you see this enormous fireball and you're like, oh, my God, it's the ISS coming back down, you know? And granted, not all of it's going to survive the atmosphere i mean but still parts of it might survive that they can't i don't think they're they can deorbit it like in total you know what i'm saying they i'm guessing they're gonna have to break it apart in pieces or obviously people would not be aboard the iss during this time i want to make that clear because i think this story came out and there were actual comments like what are gonna happen what's gonna happen to the astronauts on board i'm like oh my god (laughs) No, they're going to just keep them on. They're going to have to like surf back to earth. Like, So that's a story that caught my eye just because I think I can speak for a lot of people that, you know, I'm just, I'm very interested how they're going to bring it down. And this is less than 10 years from now. So they're going to have to come up with a plan fairly quickly to to figure this out. I hate speculating because I don't know how they're going to do this, but it's. I'm glad somebody's looking into it, and I'm kind of interested in seeing what they come up with when when they come up with whatever solution they get. Yeah, this one really is fascinating. I think it's going to be something we're going to talk a lot about over the next few years. Anyway, moving on. Did you see the Artemis II dress rehearsal photographs that went up recently? I did and it was uh i was trying not to get too excited about it because it looks like the real thing um and i was kind of like yeah "Yeah, this is so cool you know i got really excited so yeah so you had the the four uh astronauts to have been picked to go on the first mission back to the moon obviously not going to land on it but the first mission back to the moon which is scheduled for next november i think around then and uh, they had a dress rehearsal where they got suited up in their new Artemis spacesuit and went out to the launch pad through the old doors of the crew compartment. And it caught me by surprise because I was like, this, is, this seems like a very early to be doing a dress rehearsal. Yeah. <laughs> it's still at least 14 months away. But it, at the same time, as you said, very exciting. Oh, wow, look, there they are. Those suits are amazing and so on and so forth. So it's one of those weird ones. I love this story and I think it's ridiculous at the same time. It was so cool. I mean, a a lot of people probably roll their eyes at this, but as a woman to see a woman coming out in that suit, getting, you know, going to the moon. Oh God, I'm starting to get tears in my eyes. Oh boy, (laughs) I'm getting emotional thinking about it. Seriously, though, seeing a woman come out of there and, you know, a a woman's going to go to the moon. A woman's going to be in the same group of people that have been to the moon. Finally, after like 60 something years of us being in space, over 50 years since Apollo happened, that that is just a big deal. And I just can't wait. And to see the dress rehearsal was just like, yes, it's starting to get more real. Yeah, I just can't wait to see this crew go to the moon. It's going to be awesome. And to have people see the moon for the first time and. God, over 50 years, that's going to be amazing. And next thing is I can't wait for actual people to walk on the moon, but we'll, we'll see who they are in the future. I, I'm, I'm, I don't know. It's going to be really cool, but I, I can't wait to see people walk on the moon. I got a few thoughts on this. One is we, we said when they announced the crew so early that we hoped we'd start seeing things, which made sense that they were then announcing the crew this early. And I guess that's what this is. You know, we, they are working towards it. They are training hard. It is a long process yeah. to train a crew to go to the moon these days, more so than it was before. Okay, whatever the deal is there, that's fine. But at least we're seeing it, and we, and that does get us excited, which is cool. And my other thoughts is, is, as I mentioned earlier, I went to the Apollo Remastered event at the Science Museum, and Andy was asked what he thought would be the impact of images from the Artemis program. And he said... Uh, he said, there's a danger that we'll get bombarded with too many because it will all be instant, it'll be 4K, it'll be high resolution, so on and so forth. 
And I, I think he has a point. I think that's that's something that we've got to be wary yeah. of as the Artemis program happens. Will people get too fatigued with all this stunning stuff from the moon? Yeah. Very quick and turn off. We had six missions landing on the moon 50 years ago. Uh, they took plenty of photos, but there's a limited amount of them. And yeah. there's something really romantic about the fact that they were done on film and yeah. uh, it was analog cameras, had to wait for the film to be developed, just like mere mortals did, so on and so forth. Exactly. It, it's a different time and, and, and something I just wanted to bring up because I think it's something worth thinking going forward. You know, How are we going to keep people excited once we are there? Because the images may get boring for some people as crazy as that may sound fairly soon yeah but we'll see we'll see what happens maybe maybe they won't yeah i agree i I, i'm worried that we'll get kind of like moon fatigue i guess i don't know what to call it uh artemis fatigue because there's going to be such a wealth of imagery from it like even artemis one there's so many launch angles of the launch and i'd be i'll be honest i haven't watched them all i've only watched like two launch angles because i'm like yeah, that's cool. It's a launch. That's kind of neat. And I'm like, dude, it's going to the moon. Like, that's not just the regular launch. So I don't know. I agree with you. I feel like we, I, we're we at the danger of being kind of like, nah, whatever. Just a routine space trip. Just a routine <laughs> trip to the moon. I mean, it is crazy, isn't it, that we're talking about potentially getting fatigued or oversaturated with things of humans on the moon. Yeah, I mean that's a crazy that's a crazy concept that we're we're even considering the fact that we might get bored of that. Yeah, it's like for all mankind almost because on in their universe they got people on Mars and the Moon, you know, and they're probably like whatever. Yeah, yeah, just another day. It does about the Moon. Just yeah. another day in the office. Speaking of for all mankind, I wondered whether you're going to bring this up. Yeah, speaking <laughs> of for all mankind, um. The season, we haven't talked about this yet, but the season four trailer, or actually it's not even really a trailer, it's like a teaser for For All Mankind has dropped. It's available on um, YouTube, probably through Apple TV. It will be in our show notes. Yes. And um, the the teaser, uh, I don't want to spoil it too much for people who haven't seen it, but if you watch the last season, you, you'd know they're on Mars, basically, but... Uh, season four appears to be they're still on Mars doing stuff on Mars just with a lot bigger community and some of the show regulars are coming back and they're a lot older this time (laughs) Ed Baldwin's about in his autograph show years but he's not doing that he's still apparently working as an astronaut so it'll be really interesting to see what kind of horrible crap unfolds this season (laughs) Because last season about destroyed me. So uh, seriously, the last episode, I don't want to spoil it for those of you who have not watched it because I've been told by certain people, namely Chris Spain, that I spoil episodes on this podcast. (laughs) Hi, Chris. I'm very curious to see what uh, story arcs and what will happen to certain characters uh, that we were familiarized with last season in this season, that's all I gotta say. If they kill Danielle, yeah. I'm gonna I'm gonna freaking murder somebody, man. I swear to God. It's always been an interesting concept with, with a TV show that that goes through about a decade between seasons, and and as a result, after not long, your favorites are super old. Yeah. After not many seasons, and obviously with that becomes the circle of life. Yeah. So so of course it's a certainly an interesting way of making a TV show because you get connected with a character and then they're old. <laughs> so yeah. uh, it, it limits how, how far you can take that. Or they get killed or something <laughs> like that for, you know, just mysteriously. Yeah. I don't know. I don't know. I'm, I'm still like, I'm still mad at Ro- Ronald D. Moore for the last season. Ronald, I'm mad at you. Okay. We need to talk. We need to talk. <laughs> I think I'll, if I can, I'll try and do, I might just have to have it on in the background, but I'll try and do what I did. Uh, for previous seasons of having it on uh, and, and reminding myself of the previous three seasons before I start season four. I may not have time. Well, I won't be able to devote my time and watch yeah. it to full thing, but I might just have it on as I'm doing things to get in the mood. Got a couple of months now, haven't we? Yeah, I think Yeah, I think it comes out in November, November I, I believe. I yeah, I think it's supposed to debut in November. We got a teaser trailer from it, and there's also... Uh, there's actually a Helios website. If you're familiar with last season, yes. Helios was 
kind of like a Elon Musk. It was sort of like a SpaceX analogous company, basically, like a, a private yeah. space company. A big commercial yeah. space company, basically, yeah. Sort of like a, you know, and it had a, a sort of a, you know, a, a tyrannical CEO who is probably based on Elon Musk, you know, whatever. I don't want to get <laughs> too crazy here, but um, Helios actually has a website now and uh whether the ceo uh i think it was dev was his name uh, whether he's still in yeah. charge of the company i have no idea we'll i guess we'll find out next season i'm really looking forward to it um i was honestly kind of hoping ed baldwin would be at, at home uh doing autograph shows and and signing bedpost for female fans <laughs> but um <laughs> you know i was hoping he'd be doing stuff like that but he is obviously uh, still got the space bug, but we'll see. That was the only big spoiler that was provided by the the teaser trailer. Uh, and while we're talking about things that we can watch, I haven't seen it yet, but on Amazon Prime last week, a new movie has dropped called yes. A Million Miles Away. I have not seen it yet, but I have Amazon Prime and I, I really need to watch it. Um, I'm going to Huntsville this week for the Skylab 50th thing. And I'm hoping to download it for the plane. Yeah, that's what I'm gonna. I'm planning on doing. I'm hoping to download it so I can uh, watch it on the plane ride over. So yeah. So it's a, it's about the life of Jose Hernandez, uh, an astronaut who flew on the space shuttle. Everyone who has seen it is saying really good things. I've seen yes. some really positive stuff. So uh, excited about this. A little bit dis- disappointed that it's gone straight to Prime. Is, is that the new? Uh, is a new straight to video? It feels like a film like this should be in the cinema, but you know, I, I guess at least we're all being able to watch it, which is nice. Yeah, like you said, I've heard nothing but awesome things about the movie on Space Hipsters. Somebody posted about it because in a million miles away, the real Jose Hernandez shows up in the film. A minor spoiler. Oh, really? He does okay. show up in the film. I have to spot the cameo. Exactly. He has a cameo in the film. And somebody put that up on Hipsters, and that post exploded. I mean, that post got probably like, <laughs> uh, I'm serious. I'm, that post got like almost a million views. Wow. I hate it when people are like, oh, represent- representation's not that big of a deal. I'm about to say a cuss word. That's a bunch of BS. Obviously, it's it's a big deal. You know, if people are rejoicing over it, you know, and like, oh, finally, we're seeing somebody who represents people in our country going to space, you know, not just one yeah. type of person. So to me, that shows that representation is is still a huge deal. It's hugely important to have these things out there so people can say, hey, this person's life is kind of like mine. And they did this. Also, I believe this is based on his book uh, of the same title. Um, which I've again not read, but I, I now need to. I now want to go and get that as well because uh, I do like a book. I am I am a book man, so uh, I think I'll need to dig that out. If anyone has read that, please let me know what you think of it. Um, I'd love to hear from you. So, is there anything else caught your eyes? Just a brief one, brief thing. And again, this is from uh, Space dot com. The Perseverance rover also set a record for the longest Mars drive on autopilot which is kind of crazy too that that also speaks for the importance of autonomous robotic spacecraft on other planets and how effective they can be apparently the autopilot was so good it even guided it through boulders not seen by orbiting spacecraft so that to me is just incredible and it like again again it kind of speaks to you know what a world we live in we have spacecraft on other planets that can do these kind of things and not, you know, get horribly yeah. stuck on something. <laughs> I mean, I'm a, I'm a human and I would probably not be able to do that. <laughs> I'd be like, nah, I, I, give, <laughs> I give up. I'm not climbing this damn thing. <laughs> I think that's an incredible. And uh, I believe Perseverance hasn't been up there since, what, 2020 or so? It, it's been a few years since it's been up. Yeah. Yeah. And, it's, and it has, and I believe it's the one that has the uh, little helicopter as well. <laughs> the yeah, little yeah, adorable yeah, yeah, yeah. helicopter, the drone. Well, it's kind of Still like a drone, strong. but yeah, it was only supposed to last, you know, a few days, I think, or something like that. And now it's been it's been a few years and it's still flying and doing its thing. I think that's incredible. And that obviously will teach us a lot about how to fly on other planets. And hopefully we can get around on if we go to Mars, eventually it could show us how to fly from one place to another on there, which would be really awesome. So. 
Yeah, I got the uh, I got the Lego Perseverance kit. Uh, I haven't That's built cute. it yet because um, I haven't had time. But yeah, I'm looking forward to that as well. Having my own little uh, Percy and Ingenuity to play with. <laughs> Yes, I am I am that child. Yeah, if I had ingenuity in my house, I would probably never get anything done because it's just I love yeah, just go. <laughs> <laughs> It's so cute. I love it. I love the idea of yeah. having a little Mars drone. I just think that's so cool. You know, that's such a neat thing. But absolutely it's another example of what a world we live in now that we have these things absolutely. going on and we're just all casual about them. Like, yeah, we got a Mars helicopter. Like what? <laughs> Wait, what? I I vaguely remember back in the day where we only had one or two things on Mars. We had Viking 1 and Viking 2, and that was like, whoa, that was a big deal. And now we've got, we've had a lot of rovers and landers on Mars, and we're going to continue to do that. So that's really cool. Agreed. Agreed. Right. I'm going to just do a, a very brief little rundown here. There's some stories from private space companies, which are worth discussing. First up, let's talk about Virgin Galactic, which is cracking on with their tourist flights now. Uh, They're about to have their fourth tourist flight launch on the 5th of October, and it will include the first Pakistani person to go to space, which is always good, as you you talked about, the more we open up this door and have different people uh, from different backgrounds and different countries go, I think the better they can take that journey back to their countries and their communities and share the story. And I think... uh, that's what that's a wonderful thing. So uh, also Axiom have announced the AX3 crew which will go to the International Space Station. They're scheduled to launch in January, but these ten, these flights tend to get delayed. So we'll see. And what's interesting about this one is it's going to be the first all European commercial space flight. That is crazy and it's it is not ESA, it's independent of ESA, which is really cool. Yeah, although ESA yeah. are involved. So it's obviously on a SpaceX uh, Dragon capsule, um, as, as what Axiom are using these days. Michael Lopez Alegria, who was uh, a NASA astronaut, this will be six times the space, he's commanding the mission. I know people are thinking, hang on a minute, isn't he American? You just said all European. He has dual nationality. He's also a Spanish citizen. I was about to say Spanish too. Yeah, so that makes yeah. sense. He's part, yeah, he's, he's still European. It counts. Uh, the, an Italian Air Force colonel called Walter Villade, who also flew on a Virgin Galactic suborbital flight in June. Oh, wow. so he's now going up for a full orbital experience. So I like that. Marcus Wunt, maybe it's Wunt, I don't know how to pronounce that. It's W-A-N-D-T uh, of Sweden. He is one of the new ESA astronauts. He's just been announced as an astronaut. Remember, we, I think we spoke about that yeah. recently, that he would be going up. So he's going to be going up. And Alper Jesavatsi, I think I'm saying that wrong. But anyway, he's going to become Turkey's first citizen wow. in space. So again, another country represented. That is awesome. So that's Axiom that, uh, launch. We've also heard that Starship may get a license for its ses- second launch in October. So that might be something to look forward to. Yeah. Or not, depending on your viewpoint. Yeah, I don't know. <laughs> and I know it's divisive. I'm thinking about going. Oh, wow. Yeah, do it. Maybe. I'm thinking about it. I don't know if I'm going to do it or not, but I don't know what day it's going to be. And if I'm in Canada, obviously I'm going to be in Canada yeah. and that's fine. But if I'm not in Canada... Why not? I'm really thinking about that's it. That's a good idea. Oh, God. I don't want to say this because we're going to get blown up by a bunch of angry SpaceX people. <laughs> I know it's likely it won't succeed. And I'm sure that Elon Musk would be the first person to say this may not be a success. So just calm down. But I would love to see it. I think it's a part of history. Oh, absolutely. I think I, I think it will will succeed eventually. They'll get something going yeah. like this eventually. Uh, and it may be similar to what it is now. It may be vastly changed depending on how, how these tests go. But it's certainly a process they're building and to say you were part of it by seeing one of those early flights I think is is cool and if you can do it then I would I, I think that's a great idea as I get older there's a few launches that I did not go out and see that I regret now yeah fair enough yeah I didn't see Starman because um I wanted to go see that one but I was like man it's the first launch gonna it's go. gonna get delayed yeah. it's not it's not gonna go. And then a few hours later, my friend sent me the Starman, and I was like, wow, that's a nice Photoshop. And they were like, no, that's real. It launched. It went up. That's it. And I'm like, what? So after that, I was like, damn it. And uh, excuse my language. 
I seriously regret missing that one because that was just so yeah. freaking incredible. Like I, I watched the playback and I was like, I was like, oh my gosh, I could, I could kick myself. I also imagine at at the moment going down to Boca Chica, there's probably not uh, quite as I may have this completely wrong. And if anyone's been, please let me know. But I imagine it's not quite as busy compared to seeing something on the Space Coast because Space Coast is got the infrastructure built in to handle tourism, right? Whereas yeah. I'm not sure how, whether Boca Chica does yet and whether people even think about going to watch one of these launches. Whereas if there's a launch happening in Florida, everyone knows how to do that. It's fairly well documented yeah. these days about how to go and watch a launch at yeah. the Kennedy Space Center. So, And on the Space Coast, there are plenty of places to watch launches that might not be at, at Kennedy, Kennedy Space, Space Center, Center but they're still... But they're still great places to watch launches. You know, you're still going to get a, a premium view of whatever you want to see. Like you said, I don't know if Boca Chica has that kind of infrastructure or not, but I'm thinking about making a trip. I don't know. I'm thinking about it just because I'm yeah, like, do it. Do it. just to have that memory. And, you know, so, you know, one day when I'm really Ed Baldwin's age, <laughs> whatever age he is now on the show where I could be like, man, I did that. Or I saw that with my own eyeballs. Yeah. and. You know, it's just having that memory, I think, is so cool. So, Absolutely. yeah, I'm thinking about it. I'm thinking about it. Right. I got one more thing I want to just mention. So uh, there's the Soyuz crew from the ISS came back, including, as we spoke about a couple of weeks, Frank Rubio, and a new crew has launched on a Soyuz. Uh, so there's three new people up on the ISS. Uh, and Frank Rubio, as, as we mentioned last week, has become the first American to spend more than a year in space. And it wasn't the original intention of his mission. And he made some interesting comments in interviews before he left the station that if he had known it was going to be that long, he wouldn't have gone. And and that's caused some interesting debate online. But I think it's really great that he's come out and said that. Yes. Uh, I, I think it's really wonderful that, that someone has said that who's gone through it. It's hard. Living in space, living on a space station has got to be hard. Now, I would love to go and do it. I would love to go and spend time up there. Uh, in my head, I'd like to spend a, a year I could do easily up there, but I'm sure it wouldn't be easy. And I think the thing yeah. that is, is hard is that you spend so much time away from your your people back on Earth. Uh, yeah. And he's got kids who are high school age, I believe, or college age or... or well, he's got kids who are growing up and he's missed a year of their lives from being in space. Yeah. Now, he was going to miss six months of their lives. And, and I guess you always are probably slightly prepared for the fact that you might end up being longer than you were going to. But to add another six months on is a long time. So I don't yeah, mind the fact nuts. that he said that at all. Uh, it doesn't offend me. But some people have been really kind of offended by the idea that an astronaut is unhappy that they had to spend a year in space. And it's not that he said he's unhappy or that he didn't enjoy it or that he didn't embrace the moment of being there. He may but have reconsidered if, it. Yeah, If, if he, he was told, told beforehand it would be a year, he would have said, I'll miss that mission if that's okay. I'm happy with a six-month one. Yeah, and, I understand and, and that. I don't. I don't understand. I don't that's understand fair. why anyone could say that's not a, a sensible thing to say. You know, we all have our our limits and 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 with what we are willing to do, whether that's our job or not. You know, I'm a musician who likes to go and tour. I tend not to tour for too long because I like to come back. Exactly. But then I can go. Like you know, I can do that it's slightly easier than going to space. It's a slightly wrong example, but yeah. you you can see my point. Some people like being yeah. on the on the road. Not, don't that, some people some musicians don't have a permanent address because they're on the road the whole time. Uh, yeah. Whereas I like having a permanent address most exactly. of the time. Exactly. <laughs> yeah, that makes sense. You, you can see my point that that actually we all have our limits, even when it's our job of what. How how long we want to be away from home, and lots of people have got other jobs where they've done things like this. Some people have no issues with being away for long periods of time. Some people have a limit to it, and even if you're astronaut, I don't think there's a problem with saying my limit would would be this. He also then has done the job, even though that limit got extended. You know, it's not like he didn't do the job cor correctly after it getting extended. He's 
thrown himself full force into spending a whole year in space and making the most of that opportunity. He's just simply said, if you told me beforehand, I would have said no. But I think it's also refreshing to have these conversations about how hard it is to live in space because as we're going to start going up there for a longer period of, of time, I think it's important that us who aren't going to be doing that appreciates what those people up there are putting themselves through for that, for us to learn what they are learning by being there, for us to get the benefits of, of there being a permanent presence in space. I think it's important that we hear how hard it is uh, and yeah. we don't silence them because we think they should be grateful for the opportunity. Yeah. They are grateful exactly. for the opportunity, but there's still a limit to what you are willing to put yourself through. That's that's where I yeah. stand on that. I think it's great that he's been so open and honest. I'm glad he was honest about it. And like you said, I, I didn't take it as, you know, he wasn't grateful for the opportunity. I took it as, you know, he was more like it was a challenge. I'm sure physically it's been a challenge as well. I mean, Absolutely. your body when you're when you're in space, I would love to get more space medicine experts on the show to discuss these things because I, I find it fascinating and I think it's very important as we go further into space in the future. These are things we have to think about, but space has a, a an effect on your body. You know, it affects your blood, it affects your muscle mass, it affects your bone health, it affects probably your vision, it affects, I mean, it probably affects every major system of your body and that can't be easy you know i know the first few days you're in space you're probably dealing with your vestibular system is probably messed up because it's like whoa what what's going on here why am i in free fall what's going on but after that you know you have to work out to maintain your muscle mass and your and your bone density because it's just a different environment in space you don't have that gravity working on your body where you can keep those things 100 percent. you're gonna lose some of it and granted, they do things to to mitigate it, but it's it's not a it's not like a hundred percent being on Earth. It's a different environment. It's like being under the sea, or something like that. I, I, it's not the same thing as being under the sea, but I liken it to almost doing a deployment on a, you know, on a carrier or a submarine. You come back and your body is different because you haven't yeah. you've been in a different environment for six plus months. I mean, I've done a deployment before, and when you come back. Your first thing you do is you want to eat this rich, sinful meal, and then you eat that, and your stomach does not react to it like it did six months ago. I mean, I'll just, I'll just put it that. I'm gonna put it that way, and I'll drop it. I'm not gonna go into detail, but there's an adjustment period. You know, your body isn't the same as it was, and it's the same thing with space flight. And I don't think, you know, the people who are mad at him for saying that, I don't think they've taken that into consideration how physically difficult. It must have been and, and will be for him to acclimate. I mean, he's got to come back now and acclimate back to Earth. That's not going to be fun. I mean, also, this was this was his first space flight. It, yeah. You know, it's not like he's had experience of this before to exactly. build him to build him up to it. I'm fairly sure that people have spent this long time, this amount of time in space before have been before. I may have that wrong, especially with the cosmonauts, but I don't think America have sent anyone up on their debut flight before, and it been that anywhere near a year. So that's the yeah. only thing. Also, this is a guy flew Blackhawks helicopters and as yeah. At 600 or, or something like that combat hours in, in Bosnia, Iraq and Afghanistan. He, he's also a medical doctor and has also gone on to become an astronaut. I mean, this is a guy that's got some serious... Uh, He's not a softie, is he? <laughs> he's qualified. <laughs> he's not a delicate flower. He, you know, he's not yeah. just as qualified. He's also hard as nails. He's also someone yeah. who's. Oh yeah. He's not afraid of a bad situation. Exactly. Uh, yeah. Of, of being uncomfortable. He's not afraid of being uncomfortable. And he's someone who has come back and said that wasn't ideal. I wouldn't want to do. I, if you told me I was going to do that for a year, I probably would say no. Anyway, uh, I just think it was an interesting conversation. I'm glad he's said it. And uh, yeah. I think this has been a really interesting uh, episode so far. Uh, well, we're, we're coming to the end now of us showing how much happens in spaceflight in just a couple of weeks, right? Exactly. Yeah. It, yeah. Like you said, this is just this stuff has happened just in two weeks. And uh, I think when we first started Space and Things, you know, I think we were sort of like, I hope we have enough so we could do a show for several years. And now it's like there's plenty to talk about. 
We got so much to talk about. We've talked for over an hour straight about just what's happened over the last two weeks. And we could probably talk more about it, but we got to end the show at some point. <laughs> Space and Things podcast, launching from your favorite podcast platform every Thursday. Okay, well, that's it for this week. Thanks for joining us. We've got some great episodes planned for you over the next couple of months, so please do make sure you're subscribed and leave a review or rating if your podcast platform allows. It really does help us out. As always, a big thank you once again to our Patreon subscribers. We're trying to get to 100 Patreons by our 200th episode so we can keep on going, and we would love to keep going with Space and Things. So if yeah. you're not a member of please consider heading over to patreon.com slash space and things to sign up. Yep. We're at 67 now. Two thirds of the way there. Yeah. We only need about 33 more, which isn't bad. So if you haven't considered signing up yet, please do so. We'd really appreciate it. But don't forget in space, no one can hear you me. Thanks for listening to the space and things podcast back next Thursday with a brand new episode.